Perspective, heard on k Uh weekdays, and you'll hear them there with Pastor Chuck Smith, and uh, Don is with us tonight. Uh, we're going to go through a few of, uh, announcements before we uh, have Don come up, but the first thing I want to let you know is, is that we have a box over there on the information table, and there are some cards there as well. So we're going to do a uh, question-answer format again tonight like we did last year. You know, the very first time I uh, went to Israel was with uh, Don. Now, remember that? 1994. That was great. I only got detained 15 minutes uh, that time because that was before 9-11. <laughs> and then Don said something to him, and they freed me. I don't know if you bribed them or what, Don, but you got me uh, uh, freed. <laughs> And I didn't get strip search, which was great. Thank you very much, by the way. <laughs> and I don't want to take any more time uh, from Don's time uh, tonight. <clears throat> Don has been <clears throat> a good friend of mine uh, for almost 20 years now. And uh, boy, we're getting old. Lord, come quickly. Yeah. Uh, listen, there are a number of resources that we want to make available to you uh, that Don has brought with him tonight. Uh, there are several books. Uh, first, The Final Antichrist, uh, Ten Reasons to Trust the Bible. And by the way, there's the DVD as well, uh, Ten Reasons to Trust the Bible. Uh, the Jews, Jerusalem, and the Next Temple, and The Rapture of the Church. I know you're not interested in any of these topics, <laughs> but uh, great books. We want to encourage you, $10 uh, each as well as the DVD uh, are the cost for the books and the DVD. Now, this is so cool. I can hardly believe this. I just found out about this tonight. Um, Don has written, I don't know, have you lost count how many books? 72 books uh, over the years. And I have a lot of them, but I don't have them on a PDF uh, or in a PDF format. Now, some of you... Uh, older people are saying a what format? <laughs> Listen, this is a uh, compact disc that has, uh, there, and there's 11 of them. Some of them have, you know, 11 of his books on them, and they're broken up into uh, categories. Uh, one is the Bible, uh, two, the God of the Bible, three, Jesus. And these are all the books that he's written that are related to uh, that topic, the Bible and science, uh, humanity, sin, uh, and, uh, you know, salvation, uh, the afterlife, Bible prophecy, disc 10, uh, disc 11 uh, is Christian living. Now, uh, what these are are books that you can download off of the compact disc and uh, put them on your hard drive, and then you just use the Acrobat program to open up the PDF file, and you basically got uh, a digital copy of his book, which is great because for reference sake, you can search uh, a particular word within uh, the uh, PDF file. So if you want to, you know, reference a particular uh, part of the book or <clears throat> something that you read in the book, you can do it with a PDF. You cannot do that with a uh, regular book. So having said that, <clears throat> these are available to you. Uh, each one is $20, and again, each one contains uh, as many as uh, 11, 12 books uh, on a uh, compact disc, depending on uh, the topic. So we want you to avail yourself of these because there's no guarantees <laughs> that next week there will be any uh, left. There's, a, in all likelihood, a, great, uh, a good possibility that uh, he's going to sell out uh, during the conference, and uh, I hope you brought a lot. Did you? Yes? You know, yeah, shrugging his shoulders, so get them while you can uh, after our time uh, tonight. Well, let me uh, have Don come up now, if you would uh, join with me in welcoming Don Stewart. I'm going to put this up here. here. Kind of complicated here, Don. We have the gift of complication. Isn't, 
Isn't your uh, ministry called Simple Truth? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. God bless you, Don. Thank, thank you so thanks much thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you, okay. JG. Uh, hi, everybody. How you doing? Are we on here? Okay. Um, three things about this church uh, stuck with me from the last year. First of all, this is one of the warmest group of people I've ever been with, and you guys are fabulous. And, of course, you reflect JD, of course, who I've known. It's been about, it has been about 20 years. 20 years. We're getting old, aren't we? And so, uh, <laughs> but uh, not surprised because the church always reflects its pastor, and that's one thing. The second thing that I struck about this church you guys got some of the best food of any church <laughs> i've ever been at and there's been churches that have had five-star chefs that have actually cooked for them and uh, i tell you here i remember last year eating thinking wow these people know how to do it right <laughs> now i can tell you one thing for sure you have and that is the most magnificent backdrop of any place i've been to <laughs> looking out here it, it is so you know i just look at this and it's you know it's haunting the you know the mountains here and that and just the thoughts you i'm sure that you can get into your mind and just the majesty of god it just brings about it's almost like a stained glass church or something outdoors and so it's, it's just a privilege being back and yeah we're gonna be doing two weeks here and so we're, we're keeping it silent this week aren't we and i guess i could bring a friend next week but you guys got me <laughs> what we're gonna do as usual we're gonna go for about, about an hour and then of course as usual if you i'll answer questions as long as you have them. I'll stay here and, and take whatever you've got, and I'll do the best I can in, in answering, but it's, it's always a pleasure doing this. We have a great time, and, and God is good. So anyway, that's, that's my big introduction, and uh, no, I didn't bribe the guy, J.D. I just told him, you're, you're okay, and uh, he looked at you and said, okay, let the guy through, so <laughs> okay. if I recall correctly. <laughs> Thank you again. I could have used you the last yeah, time, I'll so <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start with some of the written questions. Again, if you uh, want, don't be bashful. You can write it down, place it in the box if that's uh, how you would rather do it as opposed to uh, asking it. I know some of you are bashful uh, and shy and would rather not ask it uh, in front of everybody. And, that, and this way, too, you can ask the question, write it down, and you can be anonymous. Uh, we won't know who you are until we do the handwriting analysis. Then we'll figure out <laughs> who wrote the question. So I'm going to start with the first one, and it's a very good one, uh, and it goes like this. Why does the Bible teach that as believers we are chosen and called before the creation of the world, but it also teaches about choice? How can these two seemingly opposite teachings coexist? Calvinists believe that only a certain number of people are chosen and saved, and the rest are not. Is this man's doctrine or God's? All right. Well, there's the one question that's going to take all night. So uh, <laughs> next week we'll do all the rest. No, I'm just, just kidding. Actually, we, we could do that. Uh, let me try and simplify it as much as I can. Because you're well taught here, I'm sure you already um, have been introduced to the subject in, in great detail. But just to simplify a, again the question, um, the theology of Calvinism, let's take it for to explain what it is. And it's been simplified. John Calvin was a... Um, a French reformist who, again, one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation, the first scientific interpreter of scripture, Jean Colvin was his name, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. His commentaries are excellent. He put a theological system together that wasn't actually unique with him. A lot of it went back to St. Augustine in the uh, fourth century. But to, to sort of, what has happened, to sort of simplify it and tone it down, they put it to, into five points with the acronym TULIP how to remember it. And what you have to understand here as we explain this, I'm sure JD's done this before. By the way, if I put this here, is this anybody's way? You can still see me? Yeah, I know I'm short, but I think I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay, I'm bigger than water. Okay. Five, five points that, that sort of simplify it. But you have, what you have to understand, each point relates to the other. In other words, it's a complete system. If one point fails, the whole system fails. You have to take it all together. All right. And here it is, the acronym TULA. First is total depravity. T, which actually means total inability. And, and according to the Calvinistic system, humans have no ability whatsoever in and of themselves to um, um, believe in Jesus Christ. We've been lost in sin. We are lost in sin to the place where we cannot um, believe. In fact, we cannot respond to the gospel unless God gives us the faith. And so Calvinism teaches regeneration before uh, salvation. You are regenerated. And then the faith is given to you to believe, and that has to be an act of God. In other words, you're responding to God who makes the first act. 
And because we have no inability whatsoever, we can't even exercise the faith, God must give us the faith to believe. All right? That's the first point. T. The second point, U, is unconditional election. God in eternity past, before any of us came on the scene, unconditionally elected certain people to salvation, to be his children forever and ever, because, again, since we can't make it on our own, we're totally, totally unable, unable to do it. Um, basically, he chose certain people to be saved, the elect, quote unquote, as it were, um, because of no, and again, based on his total uh, sovereignty, it has no, nothing to do with us, what we are going to be like, whether we're good, bad, he just uh, unconditionally did it on his own will, his own desire. Um, and so certain people have been unconditionally elected to salvation. Now, those that haven't been elected, there's two ways that uh, you can look at it. One is called double predestination, which actually John Calvin taught that uh, people are predestined for damnation, those who, who didn't um, predestined for salvation. Others, there's a doctrine called preterition, which means, no, he didn't predestine them to damnation. He just passed over them, didn't save them. Well, the end result's the same. You're still lost and because God didn't choose you. And so T, total inability to come to Christ, you, unconditional election, because you have no ability, God must give you the faith. Uh, therefore, he unconditionally elects a certain amount of people that are going to join him in the you know, uh, heavenly realm forever and ever. All right, L is limited atonement. The, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was not for everybody, but it was only for a limited group of people, the elect. And so he died in the place of those whom he has chosen from the foundation of the world before the world was, and also who cannot save themselves. I, okay, irresistible grace. If you're one of the chosen, the Holy Spirit will work with you to convince you irresistibly to believe. In other words, sooner or later you will give up, you will believe. His Spirit will cause you to uh, believe in Jesus Christ because, why? Because you can't do it on your own because you're totally depraved. And two, or you, you've been unconditionally elected before the foundation of the world, so you have to, uh, you know, come to Christ. So the Holy Spirit will get you whether you, you know, one way or another. Okay, P, perseverance of the saints. Since he has chosen you before the foundation of the world, since his grace is irresistible to bring you into his kingdom, uh, therefore you will persevere. Uh, you will persevere in holiness, and that is one of the signs of how people know who, who the elect are. Now, so that, in a nutshell, is a system of Calvinism, too. Up again, total inability to believe. We can't believe, so God must give us the faith. Those whom he gives the faith, he unconditionally elected from eternity past to believe. L, he died, limited atonement just for those, not dying for the whole world. He died for the world of the elect. Uh, um, T-U-L-I, I'm trying to get my spelling. Ir I, irresistible grace, he irresistibly calls those who he has chosen, who he died for. And then P, they will persevere because, you know, what he starts, he finishes. That is, in a nutshell, the five points of Calvinism. Okay. Um, <laughs> How many, now, and the question was, how does that work with the, the will of humanity and the, the choice that we have and human responsibility and that? Now, here's something you need to know. Uh, within Calvinism, there is no one particular school. They're all over the place. Almost every time you explain Calvinism, the response from a Calvinist is, you don't understand Calvinism. That, that is the response that almost always comes, you don't understand it. Well, well, we understand it. The trouble is there's so many brands of it that it's hard to, you know, someone will say, well, this is my brand of Calvinism, this is uh, another brand, this is the correct one. Um, that, in a nutshell, is, is the theological system. And so, um, like it or not, that's what, what it teaches. It's a consistent system. And the five points, if uh, you notice, they have to all work together. They all work together to, to fit uh, this theological system, which, you know, again, they believe is based on Scripture. Now, I reject all five points, every single one of them. Uh, let me go th down the reason why. Number T, total inability. Yes, we do have total inability. We cannot please God. We have no total depravity. We, we, we cannot save ourselves. But I don't believe the Bible teaches God gives us the faith to believe. I believe God in his sovereignty, who is in control, in his sovereignty has made the choice to give us the choice. And can't God do that if he's sovereign? If God is God, it, does he have, and this is one of the questions I like to ask Calvinists, does he have the ability to leave the choice with us? In other words, can God make that choice to leave the choice with us? Does that take, I mean, can he? And of course you got to say, yes, he can. You know, I'm, what are you going to say? No, he can't. Well, if you say theoretically he can, then you try and decide if he has. Okay, you unconditional election. 
<clears throat> there is no scripture anywhere that talks about people being elected to salvation in scripture. Those who have been predestined are being predestined in Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's our final goal. That's where we're going to end up. There's no such thing as a predestination to salvation in scripture whatsoever. <clears throat> that is not taught, that is inferred uh, by certain Calvinists and passages, but you won't find that whatsoever. Uh, also, there's a real moral problem here if you take the unconditional election to its logical extreme. It would be like God saying, um, or someone gave the example, you push someone down the stairs and blame them for, for falling. Um, by definition, you can't believe unless God gives you the faith, right? But then he calls out and gives a message and tells you to believe. Wait a minute, how can you? You can't. I mean, um, he hadn't given you the faith. And then, though, eventually you're judged and condemned because you're a you know, depraved sinner who rejected Christ. Well, if he didn't choose you, then you didn't have any other choice, I mean, basically. And Calvinists answer that a variety of different ways, but basically they, they like to really dodge the, the moral dilemma right there. And this is where I come with the real problem is we are told to uh, uh, place our character, make our character the same character as that of the God of the Bible, emulate him. None of us would, would, would do something like this to others. I hope we don't. You know, we, we want to be fair to people. We want to be just and honorable. And it's such an unjust, monstrous system, the way it's, I, it's believed and taught, because it makes God basically uh, having people, creating them, knowing ahead of time that they cannot believe, and yet telling Christians to preach a message, whosoever will may come. In other words, preaching a gospel, saying if you believe, you can come to Christ, and yet, by definition, unless he's chosen you, you can't believe. You can't even exercise the faith unless he gives it to you. And so, you know, we, there's all kinds of ramifications we can get into about the so-called two wills of God, you know, the, the, his directive will. And anyway, we'll get into all that. If you want to ask on that later, we can do that, how they try and reconcile that. <clears throat> okay, the limited, let's see, T-U-L, uh, limited atonement. I believe Christ died for the whole world, not just the world of the elect. He died for... Uh, believers and unbelievers alike, I think you can make an excellent case. In fact, a lot of Calvinists are four-point Calvinists that reject limited atonement and still believe the other points. I, irresistible grace. And, and here again, it, it almost sounds like an oxymoron. He's going, to, he's going to force you to give in, all right? He's going to force you to willingly believe. Um, there's, there's, again, it sounds something wrong with that picture that, okay, if you're one of the chosen, God in his way will work with you in such a way where you will believe. You will, because he's going to get you there. And so, again, where is our responsibility? Where does our choice come in? And when you think about it, basically we have them. Perseverance of the saints. All right, this is not the same as the doctrine of eternal security. Many people make the mistake. I've heard Calvinists make the mistake. I've heard Bible teachers make It's not the same thing. Perseverance of the saints is the fifth point of Calvinism, and basically because you've been chosen, because you can't make it on your own, because God is irresistibly, you know, his grace is, is found, you, you have submitted to Christ, you have been regenerated, then he gave you the faith, you've been born again, you follow him, you will persevere in holiness, and that is the fifth point of that. Um, but it fits with the system, and it's, again, it's different than the doctrine of eternal security. It is not the same thing. I believe in eternal security, but I do not believe in perseverance of the saints. There's, again, a distinction between the two. I don't believe you can lose your salvation once you have it, but I don't believe um, the, the, the P in the uh, five points of Calvinism. All right, having said that, <clears throat> let's back up a second. Okay, our Calvinists, there's you know, wonderful Christians who are Calvinists. They're not non-Christians. They just have a system, I believe, that's inconsistent with the Scripture. The problem is what it leads to, if, you're, if you think about it logically and rationally, it leads to like, well, wait a minute, if everything's preordained, and I mean everything is preordained, then why go out and do anything? Why evangelize? Why, why go out on the mission field if these people are going to get saved anyway? And here's the man, the Apostle Paul, who theoretically taught this system, is going out, getting shipwrecked, beaten up, you know, all this. Why? I mean, if these people are part of the elect, isn't God going to save them anyway? And so, it, it, to me, it's seemingly so inconsistent. Um, many other problems I'd have, not the least of which is from the beginning, if words mean anything, from the beginning of the end of the Bible, the word choice is used. Choose this day who you will serve. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Matthew 23. How often I wanted to gather you, Jesus said, as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. In fact, that's going to be our message Saturday night on the how to walk thing. As we go through the Jews in Jerusalem in the next temple, but he says, but you were not willing. You didn't do it. You were not willing. Well, if he said you weren't willing, what does that infer? Well, 
They could have been willing, right? But they chose not to. That sounds like responsibility, does it? Doesn't it not? It does it not? And so anyway, uh, for many reasons, I have a, you know problems with that system. Now, is God sovereign? Yes. Is he in control? Yes. Does he work all things according to his will? Of course he does. Um, does he predetermine certain things? Yeah, of course. Um, so how does that work with human responsibility? Well, what, at the bottom line is we don't know how exactly he does it, but we do know this. On the one hand, God is in control. He brings forth his purposes. But on the other hand, he's given us choice, and he has sovereignly chosen to give us choice. And that's what the Bible teaches. Now, again, this is, like I said, I, I, I'm joking. I, it's already gone about 14 minutes, if, if I'm, well, since 7.30 since we started. You can see this could go on and on and on and on. I'm just hitting some of the highlights of this, and the, each point could be developed greatly. Let me give you a, a um, website. It's called faithalone.org. I believe I got it right. Faithalone.org. A man by the name of Robert Wilkin. You want to um, Google his name, Robert Wilkin. And he's the one who was the founder of this uh, group. They're called the, um, uh, what's the great, um, anybody help me with that? Uh, free, they're Free Grace Movement, what they're called. And basically, they have a journal. And there is a man who wrote on the five points of Calvinism. I don't even, I might have mentioned this last year, named um, Anthony, um, well, can't, it's, um, his name will come to me in, in a minute. It starts with a B. Uh, I, I won't I say buzzard, but it's not buzzard. Badger. I knew it was some type of animal. Anthony Badger. Or <laughs> All right. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a buzzard. It was a badger. You know, okay. Um, on the five points of Calvinism in their journal, uh, let me tell you, I've never read a more thorough, more excellent exposition of Calvinism versus Arminianism showing the, the weaknesses of both sides and coming to a position that most people, when you talk to them, hold. And he, he eloquently explains it. Each, each, he goes through each point. There is a journal article on each point, like some 24 pages long on, on the T, on the U, and the such. Like, absolutely brilliant. And I would uh, strongly urge you. It's free. You can download it for free on faithalone.org. Just go to their journal. Uh, go to Anthony Badger, the PDF files, and read it through. It goes into great detail of all these points. And I think it's absolutely brilliant what he did. And what it does, he, he, he goes into, in, into, into you know, some time to explain, again, what most Christians, when you talk to them, do believe about this. You know, it's, they, you know, they understand that God is in control, but also that, hey, we're held responsible. How does this work? And what are the errors of the two extremes of Calvinism and Arminianism? Where do they fall short in saying it's all one or it's all the other? Because the answer lies somewhere in between where the scripture teaches it, where most people hold, because that's how we live. Um, and whether you hold it, you have to live that way, let's face it, one way or another, as we are responsible. Anyway, that's a very... Uh, um, long answer to a short question. Sorry, J.D. I didn't mean to no, do that, but that was fine. the first one you gave me, and it was, uh, I'll try and be quicker on the next one, so sorry about that, folks. That was good. Okay. Um, Give me a yes or no one. That'd be couple, of, <laughs> true or false. True or false, yeah. <laughs> couple of animal questions, speaking of badgers and okay, buzzards. Okay, badgers and buzzards. Okay. okay. Uh, how about I just give them to you both? You can kind of... Okay, sure. Okay, the Bible doesn't speak about pets in heaven. Will I see my pets in heaven? And then, did all the thousands of species of animal life that we see today originate from the stock of animals that Noah took on the ark? Okay, great question. Yeah. Will I see all, um, my pets in heaven? I know a couple of cats that certainly aren't going to heaven. I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> without a doubt, they're not going. Okay, that I can say for sure. Um, the distinction the Bible makes between plant life, human life, and animal life. Um, humans and animals have, you know, for lack of a better term, a soul. Soul is used in many different ways in Scripture, but one of the ways it's used is a consciousness that they're alive. Although I've had some pets I've kind of wondered about, you know, but they were actually aware they were alive, but more or less, you know, they are aware. They're, they're, they can move, they can relate, they're conscious, as opposed to the plant just kind of sits there, you know, right? Uh, that's the distinction. The difference that separates us between the animal kingdom is we have a spirit and ability to have a relationship with God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, he said he made humankind in his own image. After his own likeness, we're told that God made Adam and Eve, and that what makes us unique. That's what makes us distinct. And so we, that spirit has been given by God immortality. We are going to live forever in his presence. There is no ending, no death uh, of, of that spirit or no extinction of it, I should say. Well, animals, it's not the same. Animals do not have that eternal spirit. Now, all that to say is we really, you know, we don't know. Let's put it this way. God could, it, in the past I used to say, no, no, no. But I thought about it for a while. So we don't know. He doesn't specifically say. In other words, 
nowhere in the Bible, you know, it talks, it talks about um, animals coming back or anything like that, but it doesn't say God cannot recreate them or, or, or do whatever he wishes to do in the next round. We just don't know, bottom line. And so let's put it this way. According to 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul got a glimpse of the next world, the presence of God, his response was, um, I can't even put it in words. It would be a crime to try and even say it because it's so wonderful and so tremendous. And I kind of like falling back on something like that. It's going to be so great. Uh, you know. And, and, and the Lord, who knows what he's going to do, but he'll probably have some surprises for all of us. So uh, uh, let him do that. Now, with respect to the animals and the ark and that, that modern, well, yeah, if the flood was universal, then everything had to come from the different kinds that were on the ark that, you know, and that. How that all worked out, uh, this is a more of a scientific question than a biblical question, because yes, we do assume that happened. I believe the best arguments are for a flood being universal in scope, meaning taking the, uh, the, the, the animals and the people in the ark were the only ones that survived this flood, um, uh, you know, universally that took uh, the, the lives of um, those that didn't uh, make it aboard the ark. That being the case, everything, of course, would have had to descend from that, humans and or animals. The best website on that is AnswersInGenesis.org, Ken Ham's on. They do an excellent job in dealing with these questions in great detail from scientific point of view. Absolutely brilliant people, men and women, writing these articles. Go to AnswersInGenesis.org. Uh, go talk, uh, you know, about, you know, how could all uh, different types of dogs descend from the original dog kind, cat kind, et cetera, et cetera. How did God do it? Or what do we, and, and again, we're not told how he did it. So what are some of the possibilities knowing how life, you know, uh, develops that we have. But again, we're not told. But yes, we would have to say that if the flood were universal in scope, of course, they would have to develop from that. So see, that was a much shorter answer. Okay, okay. good. <laughs> okay, Don, here's uh, the next one. And then I think we'll, after this one, take a, a couple of take your human uh, questions. questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Why does the Bible say in the book of Matthew that there will be no marriage in heaven? Why can't we remain married to our spouse? Okay, well, see, that assumes we're not remaining married to the spouse in heaven. Uh, in other words, um, there's not going to be marriage in heaven where there are new marriages. In other words, you think, you know, okay, now I'm in heaven. Now I'm going to get the one I really want, you know. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, No, that's not how it's going to work. We're not going to be in not marriage in the sense and giving in marriage as we know it now because there's no need for procreation for children. You know, the heavens... The, the population of heaven will not expand or contract. In other words, it's, it's going to be, you know, just like the angels, there's going to be a limited number there. And so in that sense, there's no marriage. That doesn't mean you won't be with your spouse. And also, too, here's, here's the great thing, too. Remember, we'll all have renewed minds. We'll all be sanctified. We'll be known as we are known. We won't have any sin. So we'll all get along with each other, too. Isn't that great? <laughs> that will be a miracle, won't it? That shows it. <laughs> and that will be heaven. Because let's face it, on earth, human beings are human beings the best of us, we all got our faults, right? I don't care who we are, you know, we, we try our best to be Christ-like, but I think one of the things we find is the more we become like Christ, the more we find how far we are from him. John Bunyan, who wrote A Pilgrim's Progress, said um, he didn't really realize um, that Christ didn't begin to use him in his life until not when he realized he was a sinner, but until he realized he was a total sinner from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, and he really couldn't please God, couldn't do anything to please God, in and of his own self. And that's why, um, you know, we need a savior, desperately need one. And we, as, as Christians, we're becoming more Christ-like. But then again, we still have a long, long way to go. But no, no marriage in the sense where you can't pick out somebody in heaven. Yes, of course, you're going to be with the spouse, but it's going to be a whole different relationship. You're not going to have uh, no more children being born, no marrying, giving in marriage, no children, uh, like the angels. And that was the comparison of Jesus. Angels don't multiply. There is a limited number of them, and there will be a limited number of people in heaven. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Mike and I have the uh, wireless mic, so uh, don't be bashful. Does somebody uh, have a question they'd like to just ask Don? Yeah, Ray. And, and give your first name too, please, so I just yeah. don't say, hey, you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to remain anonymous, though. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wait, is this on? It's not on. Okay. Try, try again. Mr. Anonymous. Try again. Got this. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Ray. Hi, Ray. So, is it off? Hang on. I have a big voice anyway, so... Yeah. yeah. Well, we want to get it on the recording. I think they recording. want to record it for the... Everything you say will be used Ray. against you, so... Yeah. So we just need... There we go. Try that. Okay. There we go. We just need okay. name, social security number. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Ray. Um, 
you know, before a few years ago when I was a Christian, I used to be dogmatic on doctrine and looking at the body of Christ, who makes up the body of Christ when Christ returns. I've actually found, and like studying Madame Goyon or Fenelon, or there's some great Catholics that are spirit-filled. There's some great people in all different denominations, even in like the Mormon church, which I know their doctrine is off, but there are, it seems to me there are, the body of Christ is actually going to be made up of all people. And I think my just thought is we're going to be totally surprised at who really makes up the body of Christ. And, and we will be surprised at who doesn't. And do you agree with that, that it can come from anywhere, or does it have to come from a certain area? No, that's a great, great point, Ray. At the end of the day, you know, this is something that um, uh, we, we, we don't know. We don't know who's in, who's out. We don't judge. And, and uh, you brought up a, a good point. First Timothy 3, 2 talks about a um, uh, qualification of an elder. And the Greek word didactikon there is usually translated apt to teach, an elder or a leader ought to be apt to teach. Well, one of my classmates in um, Biola University in the early 70s, we took second year Greek together, David Black, became a world-class Greek scholar. In fact, the ISV, International Standard Version, is basically his baby, his translation. He, he got an interesting argument. He says this word also means teachable, not just apt to teach, but we're also teachable too. And that's something all of us should be, is teachable. And God help us to where we get to the place where we think we know it all. Um, here's what we do know. Well, we start with what we do know for sure. There is one way to get to the one God through the person of Jesus Christ. That is the consistent message of the New Testament. There is also a false Jesus out there, 2 Corinthians 11, who is not the real Jesus that was taught at the time of Jesus. You know, false Jesus, false apostles, with a false doctrine. Jesus said false, Christ will come. And so we, we see that. And so just because someone says they believe in Jesus does not mean they're a Christian. Which Jesus are you talking about? Because the Jesus of the Watchtower is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Mormons is not the Jesus of the Bible. Now, having said that, there are people, I am certain, in the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, who actually do believe in Jesus, and they're in a cult. I believe sooner or later they get out of it. But I, because the Holy Spirit, in fact, we've got testimonies of that, that people that actually didn't realize what, you know, what they were believing at the time, and sooner or later they will leave. Now, I think what we, we need to be real careful of and is having this mentality is because we believe, and we do, that Jesus is the one way to get to the one God, that we know who's in and who's out. We don't. You know, if a person believes in Jesus, they're in, but Jesus is the one keeping score, okay, not us. Um, here's the perfect illustration. Um, when I was an early Christian, we had this Bible study in uh, Orange County, and it would met on Saturday night for about, God, what did we do, three years, something like that. Every Saturday night, there were about 60 of us that would meet and have a Bible study in a house. And it was real interesting because we're all new Christians. I was the, by default, the one here is going to be one of the greatest witnesses for Christ. You can just see the potential there, their hunger for the word, this and that. And on the other hand, these other people came in, and I thought, I'll give them about three weeks. And we'll never see him again. This, I mean, here is just a, a hopeless lost case. Well, guess what happened? The one that was going to set the world on fire turned their back on the Lord. And the one that was going to be the hopeless case, many of them are still in the ministry, serving Christ, doing things above it. So it shows my discernment what I knew at the time. Point is, we don't know. And we shouldn't judge. We've got enough. The person I've got to worry about judging is the one I see in the mirror every day. That's the one i got to work on. When I get that one right, then I'll start working on others. And I haven't got this one right yet. And so uh, here's what we do know, though. One way to get to the one God through the person of Jesus Christ, there is a false Jesus, a false gospel that's being preached. The Mormon church preaches a false Jesus, a false gospel. Interesting, though, some of the Mormon hierarchy are starting to move towards more evangelical Christianity. In fact, there was a meeting recently between some of the leadership of the church and some Christian leaders, and with the world, some of the leaders of the former Worldwide Church of God, which was formerly a non-Christian cult, Herbert W. Armstrong, that actually came to evangelical Christianity. And these worldwide Christian, uh, worldwide Church of God leaders said the Mormon church, it seems, the leadership, the, the younger ones are about 20 years away from where we were when we made the switch. So that there is encouraging signs there that some of the younger Mormons are throwing off the old Mormon Joseph Smith Brigham Young theology and turning to a real Jesus. And so, yes, to answer your question there, it's interesting to watch that. Uh, Glenn Beck is an example of that. Now, we don't know whether he's come all the way to Jesus, but the, I don't know if you, know if you saw the program the other day when he explained biblical Christianity. He did it as well as anybody could ever do. Yeah, and so um, 
although he, he's a Mormon. And so I think he falls into that category as there's a lot of them saying, you know, we're, we're reading it and um, it leaves much to be desired. Let me give you one illustration on that and then we'll move on to the next question. I had a friend who was a real evangelist a number of years ago. He was in Temple Square in Salt Lake City. This guy was fearless. And uh, he was handing out tracts and he ran in to a person who at that time had a Hi, I don't know the exact position he had. He was head of one of the theology departments there, so I can't specify which one it was, but like the head of a department with his Old Testament, New Testament, something like that. And this friend of mine, Mike, is fearless. And he says, I want you to look me in the eye, man to man, and tell me you really believe all this stuff about Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and Mormonism. Look me in the eye and tell me that. He said the man looked at him, looked down at his feet, and he said, wait a minute, you're the head of the theology department. Look me in the eye and tell me you believe it. And he looked down at his feet and looked up again. He said, it's a living. It's a job. Okay. Well, uh, kind of speaks volumes, doesn't it? Once you start investigating the evidence, you will see that it doesn't, there's much to be desired, much found wanting there. Um, but in, if people are searching, I really believe God will find them, you know, and he finds people in the Mormon church, the watchtower. That's why when people come to my door, I'll talk to anybody. And, I, and you know, it's interesting. There's always, almost always, I, you know, they come in pairs. There's almost always one of them that you just feel God has you speak to. So I always ignore the one. I just look at the, you know, because you know, because <laughs> you know something they've got, and, and you talk to them. They've got a grandmother, a mother who is a Christian who's been praying for them, or there's somebody that, and you, you hear that too. And they, they always say, well, you sound like my grandmother. That's, aha, that's why I'm talking to you. Uh, and you just, and the Holy Spirit, you know, just, just lay it on them. Okay. So anyway, enough for that. But yeah, you're right. You know, let's, let's let God make the choice on that. There is a true gospel, a false gospel. We don't know who's in and who's out. And it's not our job anyway. All right, we got another non-human question now. <laughs> not that these are non-human, just we, we, we or subhuman. It's well, just, let's uh, we'll take questions. one more from the uh, audience. Uh, yeah, okay, Dave. Okay, first name. Hello, I'm Dave. Hi, Dave. Um, Good I to just, see you. Uh, I want to go to the book of Jude. When oh, it talks, great. <laughs> when it talks about uh, in the first chapter where it's or the only chapter in there that says that uh, that there are ones that were marked out from for destruction from before time uh, who are these that they're talking about oh Dave you asked such a great <laughs> question there uh, we're doing Jude I hope you know that on the how to walk thing on um, Saturday morning I'm leading off and that's one in my section there in the first that uh, I've got the first four verses um, I'd never taught Jude before, and so when I got this assignment, I started going through the book. I've got my little notebook right there uh, with me, and I've been studying it constantly for the last three or four months. Okay, and so let me, so I could, again, I could answer, we could kill this night easily just in this one <laughs> question here. Um, all right, the adverb there means long ago or previously. In Mark's gospel, the same adverb is used when Pontius Pilate asks the centurion, is Jesus already dead? And that, in that context, the word refers to maybe an hour. So it doesn't necessarily mean the four, before the foundation of the world. It, it can mean long ago, it usually does, but not necessarily. So when were these people marked out there? And to find out the answer, you're gonna have to come Saturday morning because that's what I'm gonna, <laughs> going to do it there in detail. No, um, but, I, but I will do it in detail somewhat then. In fact, by the way, on that too, I knew I was in trouble. I think I mentioned this on the, if you're listening to the pastor's perspective the other day, they give me four verses. And from the first verse, I find seven major topics I can develop. And I thought, I think I'm in trouble. I got 45 minutes. I got to go through four verses. I got seven huge topics that are all worth developing, even in the very first verse. And then not to mention what you've got there with, the, you know, those marked out long ago for destruction. Um, that uh, Jude writes about. And, and in fact, Jude, if you, people can possibly, possibly make it Saturday. Jude, to me, uh, not realizing this, and again, after reading it, studying it, uh, I believe one writer is correct. At certain times in church history, Jude is, if not the, one of the most relevant books of all scripture. I think it's one of the most relevant now because of the heretics that came in, the false doctrine that they brought in, the lifestyle that they brought in based on that, and the answers that God has. But Marked out long ago, the marked out could have been, you know, before the foundation of the world. Most scholars reject that. They believe it was marked out by the prophets, whether it be Old Testament prophets or by the words of Jesus. But 
one of the things I'm going to argue is the, Jude had uh, Second Peter in front of him. He's, Peter wrote about these people. Jude says they're here. Peter predicted they're coming. So they were marked out previously by Peter, and then Jude re re records they showed up. And Peter, of course, is responding to what Jesus said about these false prophets coming. And so it all kind of works together. So I'll, I'll develop that. I don't know how much time I'll have on Saturday to develop that, but the long ago does not necessarily mean before the foundation of the world at all. Mm -mm. It can in certain contexts. That adverb there can mean just previously, and it can mean, you know, like in Mark's Gospel, I think it's 1544, where it talks about Pilate says to sin, sir, is he already dead? And the same word is used of someone, something that happened only like an hour ago. Okay? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. That's one I really do know. I got my whole notebook there, so I get, I get excited on that one. Yes, sir. This Next. is a good prophecy question, actually twofold. Where is America in the end times, and will the Antichrist uh, come from Europe? I think that dovetails off of what we talked about okay, with yeah. uh, Walid Shabbat. Yeah, yeah where, is, where is American Bible prophecy? We ain't. <laughs> Just that simple, we ain't. Okay, we're not there. Okay, well, so what does that mean? Well, it could mean a variety of things, can't it? It can mean that, A, uh, let's, let's go the, here, I'm an optimist. Let's, let's take the positive side. There's such a revival that goes on in this country when the rapture of the church comes and the Lord takes his church, there's basically nobody left. And so we're, we're not a force to be reckoned with because none of us are around, right? Wouldn't that be great? Well, that's what I'm hoping for. Well, if not, then you've got other possibilities and these can go from ominous to more ominous to most ominous, if you think about it. Um, the possibility that we are a, um, better care how I say this, that we become a second-rate nation. We're kind of seemingly on the way to that right now, but, uh, but that can be changed. That can be turned around. But we, in other words, we have really no effect in the world. We, we don't, we, we're toothless, as it were. We're, we're not a superpower by, for whatever reason, whether it be economically or something else, or we, militarily, we cut back on the military where we, we don't have the capacity to become involved in these conflicts that go on. There's also an ominous possibility, and this is not impossible that America could, could no longer exist as a nation, could be destroyed, something could happen either, you know, terrorism externally, internally, homegrown or whatever, Islamic terrorists could, uh, what they want to do, you know, is, um, you know, destroy the, um, the U.S. and find ways of doing it. Fortunately, Jack Bauer stopped him so far from doing it, but we don't know if that'll ever, uh, <laughs> that'll continue on. Now that the series canceled, it's, well, anyway, I don't know if you watched it before, but anyway, uh, sorry about that. Um, the, um, yeah, America's, we're not there. We're not a prominent, so we, we definitely don't hold a prominent place. We may be the toothless tiger. We may be a tiger that doesn't exist, or, or, or who knows, but it's, you fill in the blanks. So There's four or five different possibilities, and we don't know, we really don't know what's going to happen. We don't. We just know that we're not, we're not one of the main players. What was the second part? Uh, the, uh, will the Antichrist come out of Europe? Yeah, one of the books we've done on the three-part series, the uh, final Antichrist, we talk about him. Yes, he's going to be the final, he's going to be a Gentile, non-Jew. He's going to be the final Caesar, the, you know, like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, great king. He is going to come out of Europe, the people of the prince that shall come, according to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, will destroy the city and the temple. Well, there's a Roman conflagration that did it. He will come from the ancient, revived Roman Empire somewhere from Europe. And, of course, that's where the power will be in that day. Um, that's coming, yeah. And so, um, and that's a fascinating subject. Um, we get on that. Um, when I give a talk, just as an aside, on the final Antichrist, I, there's so many interesting questions there. I've, and, but I've got a talk, actually, it's a whole different on that, comparing the qualities of Jesus Christ and the Antichrist, because Jesus shows us what we're to be like, Antichrist, what we're not to be like. I want to know exactly what I'm not to be like, so I know what I can be like, you know. And so you've got the the the, the contrast there, but it's fascinating. It's uh, subject to to study, and but yeah, he's definitely going to be European. Mm -hmm. okay. After the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says that dead people came forth from their graves and walked the earth. Who were these people and where did they go? Did they eventually return to their graves or ascend into heaven? Yeah, great question. Unique to Matthew's gospel is what he says in chapter 27, around verse 51, 52. Um, 26, not 27. Is it 26, 51, 52? Anyway, um, 26, um, I believe. Um, there's When Christ dies on the cross, um, the graves are open, the rocks are split, and certain people come out of the tombs, appear to people after his resurrection. All right, unique to Matthew, and it's interesting Matthew only records that because Matthew written to the Jews about the resurrection that will happen when the Messiah comes. Um, who they were, we don't know. How many? We don't know. Some of the dead, 
So not all of the dead. Not and and some and again, people have speculated. Some of the early church fathers speculated be like Adam. They named about three or four. We don't know. It's, we're not told. Okay, so the answer is we're not told. It's one of these miracles in Scripture that happen with respect to the cross that we're told just the bare bones of that, and only by Matthew, and that's it. And so we know that certain people who were in the graves came up from the graves. They appeared to many in the city of Jerusalem. Now, what happened to them afterwards? We are not told, you know, and so we can speculate, but your speculation is as good as mine. If we don't know, we simply don't, don't know. By the way, as a total aside to that, let me just say, just take a minute or two minutes to tell you about a real exciting project I may be involved on. Stephen Austin, who many of you may be aware of, is a world-class geologist. He has done quite a bit of study with earthquakes. He's an expert on that, the Dead Sea, uh, Israel, the Middle East. He has a theory, and, and he thinks it can prove it. He, he says, first of all, the Dead Sea has basically 4,000 years of history have been contained in the Dead Sea and the various layers there documenting what's happened. In 65 BC, there was a tremendous earthquake that happened that's been recorded by Flavius Josephus Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. There is the um, remnants of that. We know exactly when that happened. When Jesus died in AD 33, another earthquake happened. The rock split. Uh, Steve figures it be about a 5.5 earthquake. It would have registered in the Dead Sea. And so what he wants to do is go over there and do some measurements and see because at the 65 BC, there is a definite, um, you know, the evidence there and the layers where something happened, you know, that there was an event that happened that, that, that was an anomaly. And again, we know when, that was the earthquake of, of 65 BC. And he thinks he can find evidence, empirical evidence, that there was an, another anomaly, an earthquake happened, you know, give or take five years, year AD 33, when Christ crucified on the cross, the rock split, which will show physically the miracle that happened at the time Jesus um, died on the cross, where the earthquakes, the rocks split, and the people came out of the graves. That would have been recorded. The Dead Sea would have been strong enough to be recorded at the Dead Sea. He believes he can find and record scientifically, empirically, where that evidence is there in the different layers of the Dead Sea. Now, isn't that exciting? Talk about a great apologetic thing, because there's no other event anywhere around that time that was recorded. They don't have, like, one in a, every hundred years, they have an earthquake there. And right at that time, right at that moment, I mean... Come on, uh, that would be another great apologetic evidence. So I may be going over with them. Uh, last time we talked, it would be January if we do that, but uh, exciting thought, isn't it? Very exciting. Yeah, exciting. Very so cool. just as an aside, but the, the whole Matthew one, um, don't know exactly what happened there. Okay. Uh, I know that we Christians look forward to our new body in heaven. However, I have read that actually, uh, we actually keep our body, but it becomes new and incorruptible. No disease, no aging, etc. In the way we, w uh, in that way, we will recognize each other in heaven. Uh, let me uh, add to this. Sure. Um, uh, are you of the school that we uh, leave our bodies behind at the rapture, or are they? Is there a metamorphosis? They're tra okay. transformed. Yeah. Great question. First of all, you guys are asking really good questions. Every question has <laughs> been excellent tonight. Yeah. Uh, written ones and verbal ones, so um, well taught, and of course, I'm not surprised at this group, but excellent questions and good questions. Okay, to answer your question, uh, <laughs> the Bible teaches, and here's the thing, on the resurrection of the dead, how shall the dead be raised? All right, the body that was put in the grave will be raised. I have a whole talk on that when I do the rapture of the church. The one that comes out of the grave uh, will be raised, incorruptible, immortal, you know, um, forever and ever in the you know, imperishables, I know the final M there, in the presence of the Lord. The spirit, which is the real us, goes with the Lord, the body goes in the grave. They will be joined at the resurrection of the dead. Yes, there is a continuity. It's the same body, but a changed body, a spiritual body as, composed, as uh, opposed to a natural body. 1 Corinthians 15, it is sown a natural body, sukakos in the Greek, characterized by the soul, the senses, the nature, old nature, it has raised a spiritual body, a body characterized by the spirit, pneumaticos, characterized by the spirit. So it'll be a body, but a spiritual body, a body for the spirit world, a body that's, it's, yes, it's going to be us. It's going to be this, uh, 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 this body that's going to be made perfect. Everything will be working 
perfectly in the new body. So there will be that continuity there. So it won't be a different body. It will be the same body, but a perfect new body that we have. And as we mentioned the other day, one, um, one, when we were doing, um, where was it, Sierra Vista, Arizona, uh, one of our friends there, uh, Dana asked the question. She said, um, does that mean I'll be a size four for all eternity, having a perfect <laughs> body? And I said, I can, can't guarantee you that, but I can guarantee you this is going to be perfect. And everything about it will be perfect 1,000%, and so there'll be nothing wrong with it. Now, with respect to the question, are at the rapture of the church, what happens to the living? They are changed. Their bodies are changed. In other words, we will disappear. We will be here one second, and the next second we will be gone. No, there's not... the. This body will be, our body will be changed into a new body. There is, a, again, the continuity that's there. And how do we know this? Because we're going to have a body likened to Jesus. The same Jesus that was put in the grave was raised from the dead three days later. It's not a different body. It's the same body, but a glorified body, same Jesus, but with new properties. So the glorified body will have a continuity with this one, but it'll be perfect. and It'll be completely 100%, uh, um, you know, made for the divine, uh, the, the next realm. But uh, no, I don't believe there's going to be bodies left behind. I believe we're going to be changed. We're going to be, uh, we're going to disappear. This mortal will put on immortality and we will, you know, we will be changed. So that, does that answer everything? Good. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I want to say that if you didn't get your question asked tonight, uh, please don't get mad at me. Get mad at Don. Get mad at me. Yeah. And, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, Jay. But the, yeah, the other thing we could do is, uh, of course, we'll try to get it answered uh, next week for you. Uh, and this is being videotaped and, of course, recorded. So uh, you'll have it if, for whatever reason, you're unable to uh, attend next week. But I, I have a plethora of questions there. We'll try to get to as many as we can. But let's go to you now. If anybody else has another question they'd like to ask, just raise your hand. Back we'll to the, the microphone live ones. To you. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good evening, Don. My Hi. name is Wally. Hi, Wally. Who are the descendants in today's generation, descendants of Cain as well as Lot? Ah, who are the descendants of Cain? Well, the, the descendants of Lot, of course, were the Ammonites and the Moabites. They were told that, that story there after Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened there with the, um, uh, you know, uh, Lot's daughters thought that there wouldn't be, you know, they would have no way to carry on the name and so they got their father drunk and well, we know the story uh, who are they today what's happened is and this is interesting while the, the question the different um, and this is what's unique about Israel and the distinction among them Abraham's descendants through Isaac through Jacob um, the patriarchs and that have kept their national identity they've done DNA tests where it's incredible how um, uh, something like 88%, uh, you know, because people have argued that the, um, I don't we won't get into this whole thing about the, some of the, most of the Jews, they aren't really Jews, but they came from the Tartars and that type of thing, you know, during a, um, the Khazars or whatever they're called. Uh, uh, no, no, the DNA proves that there is this continuity that's been there. What happened to the other nations? They they amalgamize into, you know, into, and they, they lost their national identity, as it were. They're, they're out there among, you know, we call them Arabs or, whatever, um, Palestinians, uh, Arabs, you know, or whatever name you want to use, but the, the identity has been lost. But God promised the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they wouldn't lose their national identity, and that's the distinction there. And so um, they're out there, and they're different names, you know, on that, and they're just, they're there. Now, now, what was the other part of the question? That, oh, of Cain? The Canaan, oh, the Canaanites were the ones that inherited the land. Yeah, okay, the Canaanites were the ones that inherited the land of Canaan, that uh, the Lord told them to wipe out. And, of course, we know the story. They weren't all wiped out, were they? So they, of course, amalgamated to some of these other people that were there, and they became, you know, the, um, you know, the people in the different tribes in the Middle East. Now, here's the thing. These groups have conquered one another. They've, they've mingled with one another. So the identity there is kind of hard to, to, uh, to trace exactly how far it goes back. But what's fascinating is the DNA thing, like 88% with the uh, Jewish population today um, you know, it's homogeneous there. They, they've, they've stayed within their own, you know, race, the, this racial identity, this. The others, have, have, you know, they've lost the, the national identity. So they're under different names, just basically is the answer. Now, what you would need is an anthropologist that was much brighter than I to tell you. They may want to give some specifics on that, but that we do know. They've, they've just been amalgamated. Just like, you know, 
we do too. You know, we marry, you know, we marry wives from um, other backgrounds, other countries, other looks and that, and we have kids and they have kids and that, and that's what happened. The Jews kept that national identity, so that's the distinction there, which is very fascinating, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, I've always yeah. liked to answer that question as an Arab that um, the Jews would be the purebred German shepherd. You talk, <laughs> talking about an animals, uh, Arabs are mutts. <laughs> We're a mixed breed of, you know, Moabites, you know, all the ites, all yeah, the see. descendants of the ones that you wish you weren't the descendants of as an Arab. But the, uh, the you know, God's chosen people have maintained their, their purity in their uh, uh, nationality. So, yeah. Yes, Mike. Oh, uh, let's get Mike uh, here first real quick. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Mike's got the mic. Okay, good. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> Hello, Don. Hi, Mike. I listen to you um, quite often on Pastor's Perspective with um, Chuck Smith. And um, I have a question, you know. Of course, we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're just looking for Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. But um, I attended a conference with uh, Waheed Wali, Shabbat. Mm-hmm. And um, my question is, he tends to say that the, um, the Antichrist will come out of the Middle East or from like a Muslim nation versus the EU. What is your take on that? Yeah, the, the question on, and that's, that's not new. There are the, one of the names of the Antichrist is the Assyrian, and there's some good people that have held that in the past. It's always been a minority view. Zane Hodges, who was a great interpreter, argued for that. Um, the Antichrist, you know, would be more, um, you know, they would put, you know, Israel, that area is part of the Middle East, the part of the old Roman Empire. And basically what they would say is that he's going to come out of there and, and possibly, you know, and it's, I guess, it's, you know, it's theoretically possible because they're looking for a, uh, the 12th Imam, the final Mahdi, which his identity, and this, and this is terrible, his identity will be known to the world because he kills Jews and Christians. That's going to be, you know, where his, his identity is, uh, amongst other things. Um, yeah, I guess it's theoretically possible. I, you know, I've, I've heard the arguments there. It's a definitely, it's a minority view among Bible teachers in that. And, and if, if something is a minority view, there's usually a reason, usually a reason there's a minority view, and there's, there's a number of them. Um, you know, it, you know, you listen to the arguments, and one of the things J.D. and I were talking about earlier, Daniel 12 says, in the end times, knowledge will increase, and that's knowledge of the book of Daniel, knowledge of how this all come together. So, you know, uh, you know, I guess theoretically it's possible. There's some huge problems, I believe, though, with it. Um, the traditional view, we, you know, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, it comes the old ancient Roman Empire, the, the Caesars, you know, and that, the, um, that sort of aristocracy type of thing uh, comes out of that, uh, that mix. He is a Gentile. The first, and remember, there's two of them. There's two beasts. The first beast is is the, is the political leader. The second is a religious leader. The first beast is a Gentile. The second one will probably be a Jew. Um, he's Antichrist in the place he takes the place of the rightful place of Jesus Christ, who claims to be God. Not necessarily that he's accepted as the Messiah by the Jews. That is a misconception many people have on this final Antichrist. Um, whether he come, whether it comes from the Islamic world, that's possible. One of the things I was telling JD. It's possible also that there won't be much of an Islamic threat when this man comes on the scene because if Ezekiel 38 happens and all these Islamic armies are wiped out, they're not going to have that threat that they have right now and they'll be on the back foot and that's where the third temple will be built and that's where many other things will happen that lead to the second coming of Christ. And so Islam will be kind of relegated to uh, at least as a powerful force in that day, not the force to reckon with as it is now, because it is a force, it is the force to be reckoned with right now, people, and again, that's a whole other subject, but it's, it, um, and again, it's possible, it's possible, you know, uh, but again, we're looking for Jesus Christ, as you say, but uh, th that is not a new view, it's been held before, the Assyrian Antichrist, you know, and that, because that's one of his names, and that he put, he, he makes his camp in the Middle East somewhere, and uh, I deal with that a little bit in the book, uh, um, I was never really convinced of it, although, like I said, there's some good people that have held it, but it's always been in the minority among Bible interpreters. Okay. Good. Good answer. Okay, go ahead. First name. Hi, Melanie. Doesn't, doesn't sound like it's on. Either that or I just lost my hearing, so. No, I guess oh, it good. was. I back. think it okay. was on, and I turned it off. Okay. You know, there are a couple of unexplained things in the, in the New Testament, just one or two. 
Just, ah, you, oh boy, right. if there's just one or two, I've got a bunch of questions for you to help me with yes, the rest uh, of <laughs> a, a woman shall not teach or exercise authority over a man. Uh, what does that do, what does that say for school teachers? Because in that sense, a, a female is exercising authority over a male. And then you have other issues like Jesus says no divorce, but there are divorced people remarrying in Christian circles. I'm not anti-divorce at all. I mean, anti-marrying if you're divorced, that's not the issue. But there are some things that, that, some statements that appear to be made and contradictions. So could you at least address the uh, women, women shall not teach or exercise authority over a man? And, you know, the polygamy issue is one that, that uh, baffles me. It seemed to be uh, common in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. All we see is that an elder shall be a husband of one wife, but we don't see an answer for for that either. Some of these th these things that were in the Old Testament, all of a sudden, just bing, bang, boom, and then you know, obviously the transition is Jesus, but we don't see a, a transition, an, ex an explainable transition for one set of rules and other practices. Okay, Melanie, you asked three great questions. I got five minutes left. Um, <laughs> Each one, literally, to, to, to do it justice would take me 25, 30 minutes, because I'd love to, because these are great questions that you're asking. They're excellent questions, by the way. Good thing is I'll be back next week to be able to develop. Let me just say a couple things in general here, because you asked three specific ones that all, that each one takes some time to background develop those. When we do the first Timothy 2, 9 to 14 one about the 13, about women teaching or having authority over a man. That's in a certain context. That is in a church context, a context at that time, the teaching elder or the, the, the senior pastor, we'll call it that, in the early church was always done by a male. The, the qualifications of the elder was the husband of one wife. Well, by definition, that rules out females. Now, when it talks about husband of one wife, it's not talking about polygamy. That polygamy was not practice to that large of a degree there. In fact, we know it can't mean polygamy. In fact, here's a great question. If anybody gets the answer to this, I'll give them a free book. How do we know the answer, it could not be polygamy from, anybody know why it couldn't be polygamy from the description of something else we see in the New Testament where it talks about the husband of one wife? Anybody know where I'm going with that? I want to give and take a wild guess. Okay, when it talks about females, it talks about them being what? Having one husband, right? Or, or same thing, the wife of, a, of one man. Polyandry the, was never practiced in the Roman Empire. In other words, women didn't have many husbands. In fact, polygamy wasn't that widespread either, but polyandry was non-existent. And so here's the argument. It, it says the husband will be, you know, the husband of one wife, the wife of one husband. Well, okay, so it's not talking about multiple husbands or multiple wives because wives didn't have many husbands. So the, the reverse of that can't be the husband can have many wives. It's talking about something else. Okay, sorry about that. I just got it on the side there. <laughs> anyway, um, what's going on there, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question, and there are good people who differ on this, really good Christians. But here's what we do know. The prohibition is not across the board. Why? Women can teach. Women can prophesy. Philip had four daughters who prophesied. It talks about a woman covering her head when praying or prophesying in the church. So certainly the silence isn't, you know, across the board. Um, and so we, we know that. Um, when Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos aside to further explain the gospel, we're told in the book of Acts, the Greek text has Priscilla named before her husband Aquila. In other words, it's like she took the lead there. So in that particular case, she was more versed in the scripture than her husband, and she is the one, it seems, that, uh, uh, you know, took Apollos and, 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 you know, and brought him quicker uh, in the scripture. You see, if you took this across the board, if you really took this all the way down the line, then, then if you're a Christian and you can't have a woman teacher, then you better not read one article written by a woman, any theological art, anything, because writing is teaching. You don't have to be, you know, stand up and teach people. If Teaching is by means of writing. You, you teach that way. And so that prohibition, again, is not across the board. So it has a limited meaning. So that first, that's what we find first. So the question is, in that context, it had a limited meaning. So in our day and age, what is the limited meaning of it? Now, the best answer seems to be 
that the only restriction for teaching of women in the church was the, the, the leadership position, the teaching elder, or the senior pastor. Now, people can even argue if there was such a person there as to uh, whether it was, a, you know, the early church was run by elders, bishops, or congregationals. That's a whole other subject there. But bottom line is uh, the restriction is very limited, whatever it may be. All right? It's not across the board, as it were. There's some excellent books on the subject. In fact, there's more books than if you and I would start reading one book a day to the rest of our life, we would read books on this whole subject of the role of women in the church and men and how it's, how it's supposed to work. Um, there was one, and I can't remember the name of it right now, um, that was edited by Craig Blomberg, B-L-O-M-B-E-R-G. It was written by two men, uh, two women, that each, uh, t the two women, um, one on each side and the two men, one on each side about, you know, whether the, what role should the women have in the church, whether they can be the, you know, the, the pastor, the, the teacher and all that. Or every, is everything open or is there a limitation to it? And it was a fascinating book written very well by, um, I can remember, Linda Bilville, B-E-L-L, B-I-L-L-E -L -L -E was one of the authors. Uh, Thomas Schreiner, S-C-H-R-E-I-N-E-R -E -E was one of the other ones. Um, Craig Keener, K-E-E-N-E-R was, oh, you got those names, you'll find the name of the book. I can't remember the name of the fourth woman, Amy something, I believe it was, but it's really excellent because it went back and forth. And Craig Blomberg at the end did an assessment of it. And the assessment, I, I, his assessment basically summed up the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. And he said basically what I just said right now, and I think um, as it seems in scripture, uh, people will take usually extremes on this. No, a woman can't do anything in the church. Yes, a woman can do everything. It seems that, that a woman can do almost everything, but there seems to be a limitation there, and that's the only limitation that God puts on it because, of course, they can speak, they can teach. Um, and again, if you took the prohibition across the board and we, a woman can't teach a man, then you better not, any article you read, you better make sure it's not written by a woman because they're teaching you. And what's interesting in, in some of the theological works I've read, I've reading these articles, wow, that's brilliant. And I look at the name down at the bottom, it's a female, you know? Because God's given women tremendous gifts in these fields in these areas. And what, are we supposed to reject all that? Nonsense. And so um, yeah, we need a lot of grace in finding the answer to this because you'll see what happens. This is why, back to the marriage in heaven question, there's going to be, we're all going to be one. We're all going to be no theological differences. We won't be fighting with each other. We'll all know who's telling the truth and all this and who's right and who's wrong. We'll find out probably all of us had an awful lot to learn. And having said that, I've run out of time, so... Pastor J.D., you can wrap us up. And again, I will stay as long as necessary. If you have individual questions, I'll talk to you. And then um, we'll be back next week, same time, same station. So uh, if you got more questions than that, I'd love to answer them. And you guys are, again, a wonderful, wonderful group. Great, great questions. We can go on and on. About a month ago, Paul and I did a Friday night at Calvary Chapel in the uh, Chino Valley. It was about 100 kids from 18 to 34. We went two solid hours. And the guy says at the end, okay, anybody wants to leave can leave. Nobody budged. And finally, I said, look, you guys are going to have to leave because they got child care there. And the people in the back there, you know, wringing their necks and with the, you know, on that. And I'm not wringing their necks, wringing, you know, uh, you know got hands around. They're choking themselves because of the, uh, you know, after two hours with some of the kids. But anyway, uh, I'll be here answering afterwards. Anyway, so it's been a pleasure as always. So please feel free afterwards to ask me whatever you want. Why don't you all stand? Let's close in prayer. Have the worship team come up. You want to have a, you want to close? Okay. Father in heaven, we're <laughs> so blessed and so thankful to you for Don, for this time that we've had tonight. And Lord, I really believe that you ministered here tonight in how you spoke through Don in answering some unanswered questions and Lord, we're just going to ask you by your Holy Spirit to take it to the next step for us and take some of these answers that we've heard here tonight and uh, bless them to our hearts. Lord, minister the application of them to our lives. We don't want to just know the answer for the sake of knowing the answer. We want to know the answer for the sake of knowing you more. So, Lord, thank you for what you did here tonight. We just pray your blessing on Dawn and just pray your blessing on the conference upcoming and all of the speakers who will be ministering. And just, Lord, want to pray that you'll go before us and 
and just have it be a great conference, uh, Lord, without any problems. Let everything just come together ever so beautifully to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.